All right, good afternoon. I'm pleased to welcome you to this IAEA webinar. Um, we're delighted to be joined today by Professor Lars Feld, Chairman of the German Council of Economic Experts, who has been generous enough to take time off to talk to us. Um, and he will talk to us, um, and then we'll go to questions and answers with the audience. You'll be able to join the discussion using the question Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see at the, uh, on your screen. And please feel free to send in your questions throughout the session. Um, it helps if the, if the questions are ready when Professor Feld is finished. Um, and we'll come to them um, uh, at the end. You can also join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. Um, this session is on the record and it has been recorded. Um, and I will now formally introduce Professor Feld, um, who has been chairman of the German Council of Economic Experts since the, er, at the beginning of the year and is the current director of the Walter Eucken Institute at the University of Freiburg, where he lectures in economic and regulatory policy. Professor Feld is also a member of the Scientific Advisory Council of the Federal Ministry of Finance, the German National Academy of uh, 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 of Natural Sciences Leopoldina and the Independent Advisory Board to the German Stability Council. As an advisor to the German Ministry of Finance, he played a crucial role in embedding the debt break in the German constitution. Over to you, Professor Feld. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Fitzgerald. Um, um, I'm very pleased to uh, join you and uh, very pleased to talk to you and, and, and give my presentation on the current state of the uh, um, German and European economies and also highlight some of the challenges that we are currently facing. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to share my screen with you and I hope this is working out fine. Yes, it uh, looks like. Uh, I hope you can all see my slides now. Um, well, the title of this year's annual report of the German Council of Economic Experts is overcoming the coronavirus crisis together, strengthening resilience and growth. So uh, the title already uh, signals that on the one side, uh, we have short-term um, challenges that we have to face and to overcome. And um, uh, doing it together is meaning, well, uh, it, it only, we, we only have a good chance to go through all these problems if we are uh, cooperating. Um, either within Germany, we have uh, the difficulties of a federation where the uh, federal government and the state governments, they have their own agendas and they have to come up together with joint solutions. But on the other hand, also at a European level, uh, where uh, particular solutions have been taken um, that go into that, into that direction. But also, I should um, uh, emphasize that uh, the report is looking forward a bit further by asking what are the medium term and long term challenges and how how can we connect the short term and long term challenges to get out of the uh, situation um, more favorably. So now we actually have the problem that we mentioned before now it's moving. So this is the structure of the annual report. Uh, we have our usual economic forecast, and I'm going to spend a few minutes uh, highlighting what we are thinking um, the German economy and the European economies are, are, are going through. Um, the uh, second part is on stabilization policy in Germany. So I will address uh, the particular fiscal policy measures undertaken by the federal government and the states. And then um, I'm going to um, um, underline uh, the requirements that we're going to have in Europe. Uh, taking the uh, next generation EU and the recovery and resilience fund in particular, but also other questions. I will not say much about the um, three then following chapters of the report um, that have the long term, um, um, the long term uh, challenges in mind. I only make the one or the other remark regarding uh, these three, which are technological progress in the form of digitalization. Second, climate change and climate policy that is necessary to cope with climate change. And third, the demographic change, which is going in the, the much further future. It's a really long-term uh, challenge, but uh, the, the challenge already starts in 2025. It's going to last until 2080. So uh, what is the situation in Germany? According uh, to the uh, uh, recent forecast of uh, the German Council of Economic Experts, we expect a decline of GDP by 5.1% uh, uh, in 2020. 
and another increase of uh, GDP of 3.7% uh, in 2021. Actually, when you look at uh, the, the current state of the German economy and the different uh, analyses and forecasts that, that have been undertaken since March, um, you see that there is somehow a convergence to these values of five of minus five, minus 5.5 percent decline of GDP in this year. Uh, in March, there were several others that said, well, the, the economy could really crash um, by minus 20 percent or something like that. And this has meanwhile um, um, given way to more realistic uh, forecasts and more re realistic assessments. Um, we, uh, when we mentioned, when we published our special report in March with minus 5.4 then, uh, given the different scenarios we were calculating, uh, many people in Germany laughed about us because uh, they thought uh, the economy would be hit much, much more strongly than we thought. Uh, and they did not believe that uh, the economy could so quickly recover as it did. Uh, we observe in the third quarter of 2020 a really uh, tremendous recovery, a very strong one, which brings us to a, a steep V formation um, of uh, economic development. But then um, during October, it became clear that there are going to be new restrictions because the second wave of infections uh, came up and was accelerating then. And this uh, uh, finally brings us in a situation where the recovery um, um, uh, subsides and uh, we will have only a stagnating half year in the fourth quarter of 2020 and the first quarter of 2021. So the whole winter period is going to be um, a stagnation. And all of that is taken into account in our forecast, as you see in this graph. Um, this is meaning we um, take account of the uh, restrictions of November. We have, um, well, you could say speculated, but somehow perhaps it was a realistic expectation that uh, such uh, mild restrictions as we have them in November are going to continue in December and probably also in the beginning of next year. And this is meaning that all these um, uh, restrictions due to this lockdown light, they uh, reduce uh, economic growth in 2020 and in 2021 by minus uh, 0.2 percentage points in, in both quarters. Uh, so otherwise we would have even performed a little bit better. And um, as you could see, is um, this, of course, there is a strong uncertainty, uh, an uncertain environment for this forecast, but probably more uncertainty than we usually have. Um, it's not shown in, um, uh, in the report where we usually also look at the confidence intervals and so on. And this does not look like that there's additional uncertainty, but when, we, when you think about it more carefully, it's clear that, that it's much, much more uncertain. Uh, it depends uh, on several risks and chances. Uh, the strongest risk is that um, there's not only going to be a mild lockdown as we currently have, not only mild restrictions, but that there are, are going to be uh, stronger restrictions in the beginning of next year, for example. So take one example, if schools and kindergartens, um, if they are closing again, this will certainly hit production. If um, value chains are interrupted, it will certainly hit production in Germany. But if we can continue like that, the, uh, um, like, like we have now in, in November and December, our forecast looks relatively safe. The chance is uh, that uh, we are going to have the vaccines. It also looks like a uh, vaccine is available uh, in December already. But um, we are relatively um, cautious in addressing this chance of having a vaccine too strongly. And we don't think that we need to change our figures in the forecast. Just because uh, when you think about it more carefully, uh, the vaccine has to be applied. Uh, the vaccination takes time uh, until you have uh, immunity. It's taking a very long time. So I think. Um, the uh, positive economic effects of the vaccine will come up in autumn of next year at the earliest. 
we are performing relatively well in Germany as compared to other countries. We are in the same league as uh, the US or Japan, uh, a bit worse than China as usual. But uh, from the other, when you look at the other large countries, uh, Italy, France, uh, Spain, and the European Union, the UK, meanwhile, outside the European Union, uh, all those large European countries, they perform worse uh, during this year. Although we expect them to perform better than Germany next year, just because the decline is so strong this year, the upturn is going to be stronger next year. Um, well, the, in figures, this is meaning the forecast for the euro area is a minus 7% in 2020 and a plus 4.9% in 2021. Um, this is including Germany, excluding Germany, the figures are minus 77 and uh, plus 5.5% respectively. The federal government, but also the European authorities, they have taken several decisive steps in order to counter the uh, recession. First of all, uh, I should mention that the ECB um, has provided uh, the European Monetary Union, the countries in the European Monetary Union with large amounts of liquidity with its um, PEP program, uh, for example, but also with additional programs when you think about uh, the Peltros, which are long-term uh, refinancing operations, giving banks very favorable conditions uh, when they provide loans to uh, small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, so this is um, uh, well, well taken to our uh, interpretation. We think that um, ECB um, rightly has uh, expanded its liquidity provision to such a large extent. In the report, we discuss several aspects, and, and one of my colleagues in the council, Volker Wieland and I, we uh, wrote um, CEPR discussion papers um, in advance before the report of the council was published by looking at requirements following from the German constitutional court's decision from uh, May of this year, uh, of May of this year, and then uh, also what this would mean for uh, monetary policy making. It um, should not restrict uh, liquidity provision in size, but um, the restrictions that come out of this uh, ruling certainly put a restraint on the structure of uh, the liquidity provision, meaning that uh, the um, unconventional monetary policy of the ECB, in particular the, the bond purchasing, the government bond purchasing program uh, they undertake in their PEP. Uh, is restrained uh, to the capital keys of uh, the member states. And also uh, we think that uh, the ECB has to um, comply with the issuer and issuance limits it imposed on itself in the PSPP program. So we think that this should continue in the PEP program too. And uh, when you look at the current figures, uh, it, it really looks like the ECB is um, trying to uh, uh, ensure that these limits are, um, that these restrictions are met. Given uh, fiscal, giving fiscal policy measures, um, when you look at uh, what, well, when you compare that across the different countries, you see that uh, Germany uh, stands out a little bit together with Italy or Japan uh, in this graph. Uh, so the uh, support you get from fiscal policy measures as a percentage of GDP is largest in these three countries. And when we compare that, say, to the Netherlands or Portugal, but also to the US, um, the extent look, looks much, much more greater. But um, we should uh, emphasize that, first of all, the blue part of those bars is showing us the direct measures financially affecting spending and uh, revenue side. Uh, this is meaning um, that this is uh, directly having an effect on the government budget. And it's a direct fiscal impulse provided uh, to, the, to the economy. Whereas the uh, orange part are only loans and guarantees. They are important to stabilize the economy, but they do not necessarily end up uh, being financially effective. So in that regard, uh, countries like Japan, the UK or the US, uh, they provide much more money directly in form of additional spending or revenue reductions. 
when you look at the different components of those programs, um, it, well, the German Council of Economic Experts has, uh, from the beginning of this year, um, positively reacted to the government decisions, whether it was the extension uh, or the extended access to uh, the short time uh, work program, whether it was um, the additional provision of uh, a fund that allows to inject equity into firms, whether it was um, a direct support of small and medium-sized firms or the additional credit program by the KFW in order to provide um, um, loans uh, to larger firms. All of that was well taken. Of course, you could criticize the one or the other measure in its design, but in the early uh, stages of uh, the fiscal policy during uh, the Corona pandemic, we uh, were very, very, very we, we, we addressed uh, the, uh, the, these measures uh, in a very positive way. Um, when we look at the um, large fiscal policy impulse that was provided in the first of, uh, the, in the beginning of June, um, also, the overall assessment by our council was positive. We have different parts of it. There is a revenue part, a revenue pillar, a spending pillar, and what they are calling, they, the government calls it a future pillar, so to speak. Um, and in this uh, pillar for the future, you find several measures um, in the area of infrastructural spending, but also spending for research and development. Um, and these measures address the longer term structural um, challenges uh, the economy faces with respect to digitalization and um, uh, climate change. Um, also, there is the one or the other instrument that could be criticized, but overall, in particular, this, um, um, this pillar three that, that goes into, uh, um, that addresses future challenges is well taken in our opinion. Um, we have a lot of interesting um, measures in the other two pillars. Uh, overall, we think that this economic stimulus package uh, affects the economy by a plus 0.7 uh, to 1.3%. Uh, there's the German word uh, for two between the 0.7 and the 1.3, I see, I apologize. Um, the uh, lower bound of this estimate uh, is given um, when some of the infrastructure measures that I just mentioned are not undertaken uh, this year or next year, but only later. And as we know from infrastructure spending in Germany for a long time, usually there is a delay in implementing these measures. Uh, the 1.3% they come up if more of uh, these infrastructure measures uh, are, already, are really spent um, during 2020 or 2021. What I would like to take out a little bit more in detail is um, the temporary cut in VAT. There's a, a lot of debate about this measure in uh, Germany because um, there is uh, well, some skepticism whether it really had, has uh, the um, intended effects on the economy. Uh, first of all, the question is how much of the VAT cut is um, given to consumers in, in the form of price reductions. We have one study that shows for supermarkets that 100% of the VAT reduction is um, realized in price reductions. We have a study um, on, um, uh, uh, on fuel stations that shows a variety of different uh, estimates depending on the product and the price elasticities that, um, um, that exist with respect to these particular products. So, so we have a kind of product differentiation already and it ranges from 40% um, um, price reduction due to the VAT cut to 85%. And there is already this huge variation. And while the uh, uh, German Bundesbank, the Deutsche Bundesbank, they say about 60% of this cut is realized in prices. And this uh, corresponds to the estimates that we, to the estimates that we have in the German council. Uh, in our report, we address the other side of this uh, equation by looking at the consumers and ask them in a representative survey, uh, how much of uh, the VAT reduction do you intend uh, to translate into additional consumption or in, or, um, in, in, a, 
um, in in uh, in just bringing forward the consumption you planned for the year 2021. And the respondents, they said um, um, to about 11% only that they want to have additional uh, spending due to the VET cuts. And um, uh, also only about 11% saying um, that they intend to consume uh, goods they would otherwise have bought in 2021. There is a variation across different income groups. So people in the upper income uh, groups, they, um, uh, they mention or they say, they respond that they uh, intend to consume more. It may just be the result of the fact that they can afford uh, larger consumption goods like uh, cars or something like that. But still, we do not expect much of an effect of this um, uh, temporary cut in the VAT. There is some of the effect, but not much. In the further course of the crisis, we first of all think uh, that um, uh, no additional um, uh, economic impulse is necessary uh, at the moment, just because much of the support measures are still, well, many of the support measures are still in place and um, the money is not fully used. You see in this left, on this left side, in this figure on the left side, how much is used in the different programs. And think about the stopgap aid um, that is paid out since uh, July. Uh, not much of it is used yet. And um, uh, what we have in mind, if there is the possibility to change something, it's not uh, adding additional money. Uh, it's expanding the option for uh, loss carry forward provisions in taxation. I'm sorry, loss carry backward provisions in taxation in particular uh, for an additional year. It was, this would be very important from our point of view. Uh, and an energy price reform would also be important. And the energy price reform is also addressing long-term challenges. And do you think that digitalization actually is a measure of, um, um, uh, of uh, uh, yes, a, uh, counteracting uh, the recession? When you think about how the pandemic has worked through, we realized to what extent digitalization might help us in that regard. We also realized uh, where, um, uh, where the uh, large deficits in digitalization are. They usually, uh, well, not they usually are, but we already realized before that they are in the area of the public sector. Uh, think about public administration, think about the health system or the education system. In all three dimensions, we observed uh, a very strong deficits in digitalization. And this could help pretty much. The more people could work from home, um, use home office, uh, the better um, uh, will, the, the, the easier it will be to maintain production in the economy. And this also holds for public administration. When you need um, a building allowance and the final step only misses, uh, is only missing and the public administration does not work from home, um, then you have difficulties to build your building. And this is just one example showing us uh, where, where we have to go in the next steps um, of uh, coping with this pandemic. Also regarding the health system, we have um, a corona alert system, which is much eager, much eager to realize data protection tend to save lives. When the, um, economic, the economic situation improves sustainably, we have to return to um, a more solid fiscal policy uh, and the debt break has to be uh, put in place again with its regular restrictions. And when you think about the um, uh, discretion the federal government still has, um, you must keep in mind that uh, given the large amounts of money uh, for which it received the allowance to issue new debt, um, that all this money will not be used in 2020 or in 2022, but it actually adds to a kind of rainy day fund in the federal government. And this would also help to uh, enact the uh, debt break a little bit earlier than many people think. So I think it could be uh, implemented again with its regular requirements in 2022 and not in 2023. So we don't have to lose sight of the long-term challenges. We have this, um, 
this continuous decline in um, hourly productivity growth with the exception of unification, of course, uh, but there's uh, a, a trend of uh, reduced uh, productivity growth. We have uh, the necessity to cope with um, greenhouse gas emissions to reduce, to, to reduce them more decisively. We should come up with a reduction at least at the uh, green paths that you show in, the, uh, um, in, this, in this figure. And we also have to cope with demographic challenges. Uh, and as I said before, it starts in 2025 when the baby boomers retire and it continues until 20, 2080, just because the baby boomers have less children and their children have less children and so on. <clears throat> An important part of um, the uh, current economic environment we are in is well, first of all, a, a structural challenge, so to speak, because of uh, the additional protectionism that has come up in recent years. Since the financial crisis, we observe new protectionism in several regards, not only with respect to the US-China trade war, but also um, regarding other things. And I would also say that the Brexit is a kind of a protectionist measure, so to speak. Um, we hope that uh, a change to the Biden administration is helping us to return uh, into multilateral negotiations with the US and then come up with uh, a better solution for the world. This is something we have to address, in particular because climate change is one of those uh, challenges we can address there. <clears throat> what we also see, and I would like to add this first, is that uh, to mention this first, before I come up with the Recovery and Resilience Fund, um, the challenge in the, um, uh, European, the European Monetary Union is, <clears throat> please apologize. The challenge in EMU is that we have some countries in the Monetary Union um, that do not have a sufficiently competitive economy um, and uh, some countries that have a debt to GDP ratio, which is way too high. Um, when you make a, um, a thought experiment, think about a situation in March of this year, when the Corona uh, crisis, the Corona pandemic hit the European economies, a situation in which all members of the European Monetary Union had a low debt to GDP ratios and were sufficiently competitive then uh, we would not have needed any additional reaction at the EU level, no additional fiscal policy action at the EU level, because each member state could react decisively on its own. But this is not a situation. We have a country like uh, Italy, which does not only experience the same uh, trend of uh, productivity decline or decline of productivity growth as other developed countries, well, there's actually um, uh, a zero productivity growth in Italy since it joined the European Monetary Union in 1998. And this uh, bad situation stands out. Also, uh, the debt to GDP ratio of that country stands out. And something must happen in that regard. Um, some consolidation, some reform must take place in order to ensure that the countries are better prepared when the next crisis hits. Um, the uh, Recovery and Resilience Fund is one possibility to help uh, EMU member countries to come up with, uh, um, uh, with uh, a higher uh, um, competitiveness of their um, economies in the future. Uh, not only because the uh, Resilience Fund, uh, the Recovery and Resilience Fund is finally uh, paying for some infrastructure that could help cope with uh, digitalization and climate change. But uh, just because the additional money allows governments in the EMU member countries to conduct structural reforms, uh, the necessity of which is known to everybody in those countries and also the, the, um, the, the necessary measures in detail are known. Um, and uh, additional money from the EU helps them to um, provide the kind of compensation for those that have to undergo the structural reforms. This is at least the hope we are uh, having with this kind of uh, uh, recovery and resilience fund. Okay, I'm, I'm going to finish now. I guess I'm, I'm somehow in time. I hope so, at least. So let me conclude. First of all, uh, I 
concentrate a little bit on the German economy, and I hope uh, this is okay because, um, well, uh, as the chairman of the German Council of Economic Experts, I can say a little bit more about Germany than about Europe, uh, and also much more about Europe than about the US or China. Um, what we can see is that the German economy uh, will have to cope with the Corona crisis further. It will take us some time. And uh, I also guess that it takes some time until vaccination is uh, successful and um, probably will, we will have better possibilities in the next uh, winter term uh, to go through uh, the situation without an additional uh, wave of infections. Um, it is and it has been um, a, a very challenging, exceptional situation that we faced. Uh, the decline of GDP in the second quarter of this year is uh, historical. Overall, uh, when you uh, make the calculation for the, the whole year, um, the decline of GDP during the financial crisis was stronger in Germany than the one that we now observe, the pandemic, uh, the Corona crisis. Uh, but still, it is uh, a very important decline of GDP. A very, uh, we have very strong uh, economic consequences of it. Uh, this triggered decisive and strong economic countermeasures by the European institutions and by the national authorities. Germany uh, stands out with uh, very large measures it has undertaken. We have long-term challenges. Well, four of them, internationalization and prot protectionism. Um, together with the challenges in the European Union play a role. We have uh, demographic change, we have climate change, and we have digitalization, and to, to, we have to address this technological change as well. So these are the four um, mega trends that accompany us, and somehow the situation can be used to cope with these problems better and be better prepared than we were before the crisis. Um, regarding the European measures, I can uh, only uh, link this to the hope that uh, the European member, the member countries of the European Monetary Union finally come up with more resilient economies in order to cope with future crises more successfully. Thank you very much for your attention.